Okay. So we started last week with reading full in stratosphere. Um, I hope you found it as um, easy to read as I do. I hope you didn't find him to be, uh, <laughs> as I warned you, he was. He's quite the name dropper. But he's also a wonderful resource for if you want to go and start reading other people's things that have to do with instructional technology use in schools. We're going to start this week with the SAMR, excuse me, with the TPAC SAMR and UDL. Now, this is an extensive, extensive module. And I'm going to try to do it justice tonight as best I can. Um, but I'm going to have to depend upon you, again, dear classmates, to do a lot of the carrying of the water yourself. Let's look at what he's asking you to do here, he being me, is we're going to take a swing at TPAC, SAMR, and UDL. These three frameworks, I think, constitute the complete way of looking at technology authentically integrated into education. TPAC is a very heavy, heavy theoretical framework, and I'm going to make it easy on you because I'm just going to let you see a little tiny look at it, and we're all going to agree that that's our focus. SAMR is very much a practitioner's way of looking at technology integration, um, and it's used in Jefferson County Public Schools. And as I said last week, if I were getting a whole bunch of iPads or a whole bunch of Chromebooks into my school, I would definitely ask for a meeting where you could review the SAMR uh, matrix and figure out what is the purpose of the technology coming into your building. UDL is very much a framework near and dear to my heart. You've already heard me talking about it tonight. Uh, the whole idea of multiple pathways in and multiple demonstrations of understanding. And I hope I live up to that in these courses that I have for you. So, where do we start? Well, let's start with TPAC, because this is where we're going to end up. So, what is TPAC? TPAC stands for Technological Pedagogical Content Knowledge. It is based upon a uh, treatise that a guy by the name of Shulman came up with. Uh, Shulman is on our wall out here in the hallway for Grommeyer Award winners, as well as uh, Dr. Fulham, by the way. His, his premise, his theory, was, is very straightforward and simple. He talks about that good teachers have a way of integrating multiple kinds of pedagogy into their instruction based upon context. Now, most people, when they talk about Shulman, they get the first part of that sentence uh, in, they don't get the last part of that sentence in. And that is so important. So let's do it again. We see good teachers, excellent teachers, who understand their content and then employ multiple forms of pedagogy within context. So here's what that can mean. If you are teaching something for the very first time, the pedagogy you're probably going to have to use is something like lecture or cognitive apprenticeship modeling. We do that a lot. We just don't realize we do it. And you are basically showing students, telling students, giving them multiple representations of it, which is the best way. You are sliding around in your pedagogy because of the context. Here's some new words that we have to learn before we can move on to understand how they are applied in use. Pedagogy. Then we can do application pedagogy. We can do deep inquiry. We can do collaborative learning. We can do project-based learning. We can do all kinds of different pedagogies based upon the idea that 
I understand my content, I can explain my content to people, and then I can help them do demonstrations of that content. Right out of understanding by design. So, Shulman's initial work was picked up by two guys. Mishra Kumya and Matthew Koch. And right here is the entire presentation that they gave, uh, I think it's 2008, where they essentially say, this is how it works. Well, you don't need to do that. You can just do this. Teacher ready to help students with the 21st century learning. But teaching with technology adds a whole new layer of knowledge and expertise. TPAC, or Technological Pedagogical Content Knowledge, is a framework that helps teachers consider how their knowledge domains intersect in order to effectively teach and engage students with technology. Stop and think. So, this over here, by the way, is content. This over here, by the way, is pedagogy. This one up here is technology. So, one of the things I always found so uh, ironic about KTIP is there is an expectation of teachers in the KTIP year to do demonstrations of technology use in their teaching. It's in um, domain number uno. And it always strikes me as, as hilarious because if you don't know this stuff, your content, and when we first started out, I think it's fair to say most of us are keeping ahead of the kids by a couple of pages in the book. Making this work is kind of silly. Because you don't know this well enough to then start doing this over here, sliding around inside of different pedagogies. So what TPAC says is what we're looking for is people's understanding of this and how it affects this based upon this. So your understanding of how to use technology informs you how you can use it within different pedagogies that then illustrate, demonstrate the content you're trying to teach. There you go. Now, I can do a whole hour's worth of blow your brain cells with this, I'll show it to you, uh, which is a PowerPoint that, like I said, you would start throwing things at your computer or screaming at me, so I'm not going to do it. What I am going to do is I'm going to remind you one more time, what we're looking for here is we are looking at the idea and let me go ahead and take you all the way in to where our work tonight lives. Oh, look, it's the same little video. Here's the model right here. There's your content. There's your pedagogy. There's your technology. And so what we're saying again and again and again is content is uncovered by the use of different kinds of pedagogies. Then technology prowess or technology knowledge then informs the pedagogy that uncovers the content. And all of this is wrapped up in context. Because if we understand what is I'm trying to do here, that then informs how this and this interact with each other. Very simple. Uh, my God, you should see the books that have been written and the mind-numbing explanations that people give about TPAC. Let me jump down here and see if that
didn't open. So I'm not going to worry about it. But if you want to look at the PowerPoint that's sitting there, um, or if you need something to help you get to sleep tonight, you go right ahead and do that. And I can say that because it's my PowerPoint. Okay? And it, I, I just, you know, when I look back on it when I was, when I did it, it was my way of trying to get my head around all the different aspects of what Cunha and Matthew were, were trying to get at. This little video right here does the best job that I've ever seen. That's kind of sad, you know, that I spent all that time creating something that is very easily explained. I'm going to go ahead and open it up. Because there is one thing in here that I do want to share with you. Uh, can you see this, Jim? I don't want to fill the whole screen with it. All right. So there's the framework. Let me just drop down real fast and uh, give you a sense of where a lot of this comes from. So this was an idea that Shulman also described, a wicked problem, that integrating uh, technology into teaching can be viewed as a wicked problem. Uh, the only reason why I'm showing you this is I think it really helps us when we when we sit down in our school and we hear that we've got technology coming, we just run to whatever the district says we should do with it because of that right there. Because it's a wicked problem. Um, it's not something that we as a school have decided to do. It's something that we're told is going to be happening. Or we're Title I school and we got money, so then we go out and buy this stuff. But do we have any real understanding? Wicked problems are problems that are incomplete, contradictory, and changing. No two wicked problems are the same. And solutions are difficult to realize. Solutions are not right or wrong. And solutions do not have stepping, stopping rules. And oh my goodness, isn't that the case? when we put technology in school. This is a quote from Shulman. If those preconceptions are misconceptions that kids have, which they so often are, teachers need knowledge of strategies most likely to be fruitful <coughs> in reorganizing the understanding of learners because those learners are unlikely to appear before them as blank slates. You know this, I know this. Kids come into your class, they already have ideas about what you're teaching. Those ideas may be correct. Those ideas may be wrong. And what we have to do through the use of the, I call it the pedagogical dance, <coughs> is to open up kids to different ways of looking at the new information so that they can add it into their repertoire. That's it. That's all I'm going to do. As I said, watch that video. If you want to watch the entire thing from the boys, there it is. Give you a sense. Right. Uh, thanks, Ben, uh, for this wonderful... Kind of echoey. And, uh, um, they talk about and the royal road to learning, that there is no royal road to learning, meaning there's no one way. But they do have a line that I like to steal and use. And I think it goes to the heart of this class. And that line is this. Teachers cannot, will not, should not employ technology to their classroom until there is first an opportunity for playful interactions with technology and the curriculum. 
That's why when I go in, when I go in watching people during my K-tip, what I see them using technology for is usually PowerPoints because they haven't had the chance to do anything else. They haven't had an opportunity to see anything else. And if they can manage the PowerPoint, if they can manage the real trick of which is using some pedagogy that plays off the PowerPoint, then what we see is we see real technology, pedagogical content knowledge at work. Because the technology sort of fades into the back. It is a jumping off point for discussion. It is a jumping off point for understanding. That's a real simple use of TPAC. Alrighty. That was TPAC. Boy, that was short. My friends who uh, are TPAC devotees would be snarky at me right now because of the way I went through that so quickly. I'm just getting tired of seeing people blow it up to something that it just doesn't need to be. Now let's take a look at SAMR. So SAMR is a practitioner framework. Um, it was developed by Dr. Ruben here in Tundra. It was a way to look at how we actually use technology. So he has it as substitution, augmentation, modification, and redefinition. What does he mean by substitution? Well, what he means is we use technology for something that we already do with something else. The easiest thing is we use word processing when before we use paper and pencil. We use um, worksheets on iPads, whereas before we gave kids worksheets, paper and pencil. If you want to look at it as the lowest way of use of technology in a room, go for it. But if you think about the TPAC model, there's room in the TPAC model for substitution. Once again, it becomes a way of leveraging the technology use into your instruction and becomes a part of the pedagogy. Not a very compelling part, but it's still a part. Then there's modification, excuse me, then there's augmentation. And that is where you're actually using the technology as a direct tool. Um, that one can look like kids using uh, an iPad app that allows them to not just write, but to record their voice, be able to talk about what it is that they are doing with it. Um, or it can be used as a way of doing a test using a Google form or as we are going to be seeing in our, excuse me, as we're going to be seeing in our 587 class, a way at looking at different content in a Schoology course, modification is when you basically redesign the task. Um, I think of modification, and we're going to play with it here, as something like GoAnimate, which is a web-based tool that lets you design, create, animate, put words into people's mouths, your own cartoons. Uh, it takes the place of kids writing stories. 
it uh, takes the place of kids understanding what scripts mean. Or it's used to help me understand what they understand. Redefinition is when we create a whole new task that was never done before. That you can't do without the use of technology. An example of that, one of my favorite examples, is using um, green screen technology, uh, social studies context for historiography, where kids basically go and set up a story, uh, research a moment in time, a place in history, and then they inhabit that through the green screen, uh, talking about what it was like, the people who might have been there acting it out, and so on. That is SAMR. And one of the things that um, schools do with the SAMR model is they have a lot of dialogue around how can we use the SAMR model with what we are trying to do in our school. Okay, that was SAMR. One more. Save the most interesting, the best for last. Universal design for learning. I would urge you to take the learning styles test just so you can sit around and tell other people your learning style. Uh, about 20 years ago, this was hot, hot, hot. This became the new, so what astrology sign are you? Conversation start. Oh, so what's your astrology sign? Now it became, so what is your learning style? Oh, I'm a linear sequential. I'm a naturalist. I'm musical. So on, so on, so on. Take the learning styles test. It's fun. Does it really explain UDL? No. No. Howard Gardner, who came up with it, with his book about... Um, the different ways that we supposedly learn, uh, was also out of Harvard, where these guys who came up with universal design for learning, they are also out of Harvard, through an outfit called CAST, C-A-S-T, and this is their guy, Dr. David Rose. Uh, it's a really, really interesting uh, video and explanation. Again, once more. Here's some more uh, PowerPoints about it. Basically, Dr. Rose says that we have three different networks in our brain. Let me go ahead and run this for you a little bit so you can see it. If teacher needs to meet a curriculum goal, he should got a very diverse group of students. And so does this teacher. They don't look very diverse to me. Oops, there you go. That's up. research shows that the way people learn is as unique as their fingerprints. What does this mean for teachers up today? Okay. So she just said that the research shows that people's way of learning is as unique as their fingerprints. And that's how the Howard Gardner gets pulled into the uh, discussion. Do you agree with that? I'm going to keep rolling. Classrooms are highly diverse and curriculum needs to be designed from the start to meet this diversity. I don't think there's any argument about that one. We all agree that our classrooms now are very diverse. Universal design for learning is an approach to curriculum that minimizes barriers and maximizes learning for all students. Whoa, that's a fancy term. Universal design for learning. Let's unpack it a bit. Let's think about the word universal. By universal, you mean curriculum that can be used and understood by everyone. Okay, let me stop her here. Let's do a little backtrack, a little history. Universal Design for Learning grew out of the IDEA Act, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. The, 
and that grew out of the idea that all of uh, we need to make things more approachable, more um, user friendly. Uh, as someone who's legally blind, I can't help but notice when I go to grocery stores these days, uh, and when I go to the Home Depot and Lowe's, that the signs that tell you what's in the aisles are much bigger than they used to be. It's because America is getting older and people are seeing it well. Simple as that. Um, but that's more a reaction to culture. But you see buildings now just about everywhere that have ramps to allow for wheelchair access. My whole neighborhood uh, has had uh, cuts made into the sidewalks uh, and then a little uh, and they fill that in with a brick that is uh, got little nubbies on it so people in wheelchairs can drive up and down and be able to um, explore, be able to use sidewalks. So the folks at CAS basically took a look at curriculum the same way, and they said we should have a universal curriculum that people can participate in the curriculum as much as they can in different ways that they can. Now, each learner in the classroom brings their own background, strengths, needs, and interests. Curriculum should provide genuine learning opportunities for each and every student. Now let's think about the word learning. Learning is not one thing. Neuroscience tells us that our brains have three broad networks. Okay, so here we go. This is Dr. David Rose's research, and he's the one that they're using here to talk about these three different parts of your brain. This is at the heart and soul of universal design for learning. One for recognition, the what of learning, one for skills and strategies, the how of learning, and one for caring and prioritizing, the why of learning. Students need to gain knowledge, skills, and enthusiasm for learning and a curriculum needs to help them do all three. But every learner is unique, and one size does not fit all. There you go. One size does not fit all. And so if you go back and if you, un if you buy into the three parts of the brain, let's go and look at it real fast. The recognition part of the brain. Kids come to the learning, come to the educational process with enormous differences in their understandings and experiences in life. You really see this in kindergartens, where little kids will sit there and the teacher is trying to, to begin lessons about phonics. And so the sound that they may be working on is the M sound. And so a teacher will say, what sound does a cow make? How many kids have heard a cow? Now, if they've grown up in households where people have read to them, or they've grown up in rural areas where there are cows, they'll get the moo reference. Otherwise, they might make a dog noise. You see, the thing about the thing we don't really get is when we have kids that come from such different backgrounds, the knowledge they walk in the room with might be very different from our own. And they also might be very different from the other kids that are in the classroom. You see this a lot with ESL kids. They're extremely, extremely smart about where they came from. But they have enormous holes. And that's how I like to look at it. It's, it's a hole. It just isn't there because you haven't experienced it. If you think about knowledge being experiential, it really does kind of turn the whole process on its head, because we think we all are walking around with the same knowledge bank in our head, and we are not. The skills and strategies, same idea. How did you learn how to be good at school? There are people who are really, really good at school. And then there are people who have no idea, because no one's ever explained it to them. Or it's all been explained through draconian methods. Why can't you sit still in that desk? Do I need to call security? If you'll just apply yourself, you'll get this. What does apply yourself mean? And then finally, the caring and the packaging and the prioritizing. 
this part of our brain basically reacts to how you react. If you demonstrate that you really are genuinely interested in someone learning something, and you package it in a way that they can see how exciting it is, what you're trying to teach them, and how important it is jumping back through those other two parts of our brain, and then making it a priority to understand, then the learning becomes very, very transparent. Now, Let's break that down. So when we look at it, we look at representation, which is where you are applying your understanding of the curriculum with what you already have in your brain, which is a harkens back to the idea around constructivism, if you think about it. And then the action and expression, in other words, who is engaging you and how, and then the engagement is, are you really involved? Action and expression are, here are the things we can do to help you become a part of what we're doing. And then the engagement. This is not hard. Oh, my God, is it hard to do. I mean, it's not hard to understand. But, boy, it is hard to pull off. Let me tell you a story. I got to go watch a K-tip last week at a high school, local high school, in a classroom of MSD kids. I hate that acronym. Moderate to severe dis, uh, disability. And they were learning about chemistry. And they were learning about how electrons move between different levels of an atom, different shells of the atom, that then form different bondings, covalent and ionic. Now, gentle students to this class, if I were to ask you right now to raise your hand and explain ionic and covalent bonding to me, could you do it? It would be hard, unless you're a chemistry teacher or unless you had a really good chemistry teacher. Now, I hope you're sitting out there going, what? <laughs> Just kind of what my response was when I got the lesson plan before I showed up. How in the world did this lady pull that off? She had a room of kids with Down syndrome. She had kids on... Um, the autism spectrum, and she just had kids that had difficulty learning, great difficulty learning. But she pulled it off. How? It wasn't a miracle. Nope. Multiple pathways in. She had, for every kid in that classroom, in that high school, they had a student tutor that was involved in her class as a part of their service. They, it was a class for them. It was a class to come down to work in her class. And before the class, she would send to them the content of the class in a way that they could understand it. <laughs> because if you think about it, how could you go in and tutor somebody if you didn't understand it? And then the information that she had wasn't dummy down, it was simplified. And so she worked them through how changes in atomic structure then causes the molecules that make up the elements to then change. Isn't that fascinating? Isn't that just cool? I mean, I sat back in the back of the room and I'm going, wow, you just went over everything that I went over in a college chemistry class. And you're asking these kids out here now to think about how they could look at different metals changing based upon what we just went through. First one that pops into mind is iron rusting, right? It's a marvelous example of UDL. Now, 
So multiple pathways in, what would the next thing be? A demonstration, multiple pathways out with multiple demonstrations of understanding. So maybe the student couldn't write it all down. Maybe the student couldn't um, take a test. Could the student explain it and record it? Could the student draw a picture about it? Could the student use a metaphor? That's UDL. Now, let's get to our assignment. So what I'm asking you to do is start here with the TPAC again. And in this folder, come down to where it says TPAC at ULCEHD. Click on that, and that will take you to the wiki space. Which, by the way, you're going to build one of these for this course. Here is, there's our old friend again with the TPAC model. But what I really want you to do is to roll down here and take a look at these videos. I want you to take your time, quickly look at the videos. They are all technology use videos. And what I want you to do is to find one that just grabs you. In other words, you look at it and you go, oh, that's interesting. And then I'm going to ask you to bring it in to an application called Blend Space. And then I'm going to ask you to explain the, the video that you have through the lens of CPAC, SAMR, and UDL. Now, I'm not going to pick on, there are some in here, that, by the way, there are some in here that are really bad. <laughs> There's some that are in here that are really good. And what I'm trying to get you to realize is if you want to pick one that's really bad and tear it apart and say, this violates TPAC this way, or this violates um, UDL this way. Uh, if you look, SAM really doesn't violate anything. You just basically look at it and say, I see substitution, augmentation, modification, redefinition. One of the four, two of the four, you know. You won't see all four of the four. But you basically just go through and say, oh, this is what I see in terms of the lens of, of a SAMR. Uh, let's jump down here to this one. And what I notice is that when I'll bring in something, and the students like it, then that makes me even more enthusiastic about teaching it. Okay. Cool, huh? A couple of years ago, I put together a video about uh, some kite fishing adventures that I was doing. And I had to learn Photoshop to do some reanimation in there. Once I became proficient in Photoshop, I started bringing it in and showing those tools to my students who were second graders at the time. And since then, okay, I'm going to stop that there. Now, if I do a right click on this uh, video, and I'll notice that I can get the video URL. This is a YouTube video. So I'm going to go ahead and say, yeah, this is the one that I'm going to use for my blend space. So I'm going to copy that. I will need to go back to where we are, unless I just want to go to blendspace.com. If you want to do it that way, that's fine. You go right ahead. Um, the other way of doing it is just um, come back here to the original uh, module, and you will find that I have the link to Blend Space all set and ready for you here. Uh, by the way, there's a resource page for Blend Space. I find that it's pretty straightforward. You really don't need it, especially what we're going to do with it. So I'm going to go to Blend Space, the link. Whoa. Well, I've never had that happen before. I will try to fix that for you. So why don't we just do it? Let's go to blendspace.com. E-L-E-N-D-S-P-A-C-E dot C-O-M. 
Okay. I'm going to log in to the blend space. And you may use my login for this, which is sbswan02 at louisville.edu. Password is ULIT241. You do not need to join a class, but as you can see, a lot of people who have been in my classes have used the blend space with my uh, username. A question you're probably asking yourself, why would I want to use your username, Steve? I'll just get my own. Well, if you create your own, it won't allow you to do the kind of things you see over here where it says my classes. Uh, if you use mine, then it opens itself up to you because I I've, I've paid for it. And as I said to you, when this class first started, there's a lot of stuff we'll be using that's a pay, and you may use my username, sbs one zero two at louisville.edu, password ULIT241. You may use those um, outside of class. You're more than welcome to them. I'm going to come over here to New Lesson. And I'm going to give it a title, Steve Swan. EPAC, SAMR, and UDO. And I'm going to look at what I have here. I can drop in a resource. I can add text. You don't need to worry about the quiz. That would be if you're designing something for someone else to use. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just come up here where it says resources, and I'm going to paste in that uh, URL. And what it should do, well, it didn't. What it should do is it should throw into here the video that I just found over in here. Let's try that again. So I'm going to come down here to my friend who is doing the blogs, Photoshop, and so on. And I think I better go all the way to the YouTube version of it. And I will do a right click. And I will copy the video URL. And I will come back into my space. And I will go over here. That's what I did wrong. And there it is. Now all i got to do is just drag and drop it. Ta-da. There you go. So let's review. Because <laughs> I did it right. You go into the um, CEHD part. You find a video that demonstrates technology use in a classroom. You are then going to get the URL of that, not the embed code, that video URL. You're going to come back to here, and you are going to put it in. And you're going to search for it. And then you're going to drag it over into your setup here. Now. All you're going to do at this point is you're going to now add text. And you're going to talk via the text. TPAC is demonstrated here by so on and so on and so on. Done. Do the next thing here. Sammer. is, you know, when I look at this video and I think about Sammer, I think he's more modification because he's basically taking a whole new tact at kids doing demonstrations of their writing in different ways. And that's what I would write here. And then do DL is demonstrated. By the way students have 
multiple ways of understanding, so on, so on, so on. Okay. Yeah, I know, it didn't go in. <laughs> Sorry about that. So that's all there is to it. It's very simple to do. Let me get rid of that. I just screwed it up. Very simple to do. Now, once you get it done, you can play it, which means what it'll do is it'll just flip through each one of the little boxes. Why do we like this? We like um, blend space because it's very linear sequential. If you're a very linear sequential thinker, hello, let's talk about those learning styles. Uh, this fits right into your wheelhouse. You'll like this a lot. Uh, I'm much of, more of a ping pong learner, but I still can play here. Notice I can move the things around if I want to uh, have a better sense of design. You'd be surprised how many kids will take the time to move these blocks around until they get them to the way that they want them to look. Also notice you can add more rows. I know um, you can change the look of it so that you just have the four you need. I don't mess with it. I just let I go with the six. When you get done, you're going to share it. And now down here, what you're wanting to do is you're wanting to get the embed code Click once, right click, and copy. Now let's go back and see what it says that we're supposed to be doing with this. So we've gone into Blend Space. We found a video that we look at through the lens of these three of TPAC, SAMR, and UDL. Okay, Steve, what do you want me to do with it now that I've gone in and created my Blend Space? And then I saved it out. We're going to go back to our old friend, the Edmodo group, which is where you should have been putting your infographics that you made up here. And we're going to go in there, and we're going to create a new post. And in that new post, I'm going to embed my blend space that I just made. And uh, the Edmodo is not letting me in. So I'm going to go ahead and just go to Edmodo.com. And I am now going to log in with my username, which you already now have. Don't follow me in this way. You have to come in on your own. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to use the same exact process that I did for Module 1. Sure, go ahead. Which is right here. I'm going to click on my little linky link. Right here. And I'm going to paste in my code. And I'm going to call it blend space just for right now. And I'm going to say OK. Then I'm going to type the name of my note here, Steve Swan, blend space. Don't need to go crazy here. And then I'll post it. Oh, sorry about that. I'm in 585, so let's just do uh, 585, and that should pop me. There we are. I'll just go ahead and keep using the book study one, and I'm going to post it. There we are. And now I have a blend space that I've created in a note. Now, while we're in here, let's finish up the evening um, with how do we move stuff, these two assignments that have been using the Edmodo space, how do we move them out of the Edmodo space over into our Vitex? It's extremely simple. So you go to the post, 
that you have for your stratosphere book study and now for your um, module two. And you click on this little chevron over here. And you go link to post. And all you have to do is take that link, highlight it by clicking on it once, right clicking on it, copy. Take that into the live text. And next to the assignment where it says paste your, your link to your photo here, paste it in. And that, my dear friends, is all you have to do to get it in. Let's go take a look. Oh, you know, I have to be careful here because um, you go in a different way than I go in, and we actually see it differently. But basically what you're doing is, is you're going to use the template. You're going to click on the little pencil that's up here that lets you edit, and then you're going to paste your link right down there at the bottom where all that is. Okay? Uh, and, you know, I, there's no way that I could show you what that looks like because it won't let me. I think as close as I get to what you see is here. No. Nope. Here. So when I come into this, if I click on this edit pencil right there, then this opens up and I have the ability to come right below where Steve's got the, the assignment, and then I paste in the link that I just took out of the Edmodo. Um, Live text has a nasty habit of it doesn't know what to do with um, URLs when you put them in, just like this. Don't worry about it. I know what to do. Um, you know, we could we could all learn how to do jump through the hoopy hoops. We don't need to jump through hoopy hoops. Because all what Steve does is he'll come in to look at it. He'll highlight it like this. And then he will open it in a new uh, tab. And it'll pop open up there in my browser. Wow. I did not think we would get through this. We just went through a really lot of information. And what we are looking at in this module is I did a very cursory explanation of TPAC. And I told you, if you'll get this in your head, you've got TPAC. TPAC is the interaction between a teacher's content knowledge, a teacher's pedagogy, and then applying technology to illuminate, to illustrate those two pieces. And so technology can illuminate the content vis-a-vis -vis PowerPoints, websites, projectors, projecting it on a screen, um, smart boards. Or it could look like using technology as a pedagogy for kids to do work based upon what the content is asking them to do. Use your iPad, draw what a molecule would look like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. TPAC is not necessarily a practitioner framework. It's a researcher framework. And one of the things that's down here, I'll show you. Here's the TPAC rubric. Um, this was developed um, by a lady who uh, has really kind of owned the whole TPAC world for a while now. And what Judy has tried to do with this is to find a way mm -hmm. for researchers to have a way to go in and, and look at things. Uh, in, in other words, data. 
but it's all qualitative data. It's not quantitative data. So TPAC. We looked at TPAC. We then took a look at SAMR, which is nothing more than a jumping off spot for schools to have discussions around what they want to do with the technology they have in the building. It's a much, it's a good place to have conversation around when you're getting new technology in the building. A really good place to start. And last, but certainly not least, is UDL. Near and dear to my heart. Uh, again, you know, I'll use the cliche. I guess you can call it a cliche. But I still think it makes the best sense. Multiple pathways in. In other words, the kid's not broken. It's the curriculum needs to be changed, not the kid. The kid comes into the curriculum in a way that they can understand the curriculum, not dumbing it down. Not dumbing it down, but simplifying it. The kid can experience the curriculum and or kids doing demonstrations of the curriculum that allows for their style of learning. Uh, last story. I have a dear friend whose son has Down syndrome. He went through high school and middle school taking just regular ed classes. He was not he was in a special ed class because the bureaucracy in JCPS demands that he be assigned to one. But he spent all his other time in other classes. In his uh, senior year, he told his dad that he wanted to take an AP course because he saw his sisters taking AP courses. So they went through all the angst that they had always gone through with their son. Uh, growing up in a family of uh, very, 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 very high achievers. And this guy is a high achiever himself. So they finally found a teacher who would allow him into his AP history class. And he said to the parents, he said, I don't know how to incorporate what he knows into AP history. But he said he's more than welcome to sit in my class because he isn't a troublemaker, right? And he said, nope, he's not a troublemaker. So he got to sit in the class. So the thing they had to do in the class before they took the AP exam is they had to come up with a term paper. You can imagine what it looks like, 10, 20 pages, I forget what it was, on a topic between um, World War II and uh, today take an aspect of American history and write about it. So the teacher came by David, he said, now David, he said, uh, if you can just identify the topic and give me a topic sentence, he said, I'll be satisfied. He said, no, I've got an idea what I want to do. He said, what do you want to do? He says, I want to talk about the history of jazz. <laughs> the guy was floored. I mean, he genuinely was floored. And he said, how are you, well, how, how are you going to do that? And he said, would you allow me to put together an iMovie where I have all the different kinds of music and I talk about where it came from and who created it and so on. So you see, what happened was the multiple pathway in was this kid being given a chance to do the 10 to 20 page term paper in a different medium. Following the rules. Topic sentence. Examples, conclusion, sources, and follow the rules. But he was able to do it by what turned him on in the way that he could approach the process. And that good teacher allowed it. Uh, this is an extraordinary young man. <coughs> uh, he went on to become a movie star. And right now he's waiting for his next uh, movie opportunity to come up. He's a card-carrying member of SAC, a SAG, excuse me, the Screen Actors Guild. Extraordinary. <coughs> but this one teacher, in fact, a lot of his teachers, 
gave you an opportunity to experience their classes by simply just allowing him to experience them and to demonstrate his understanding in a way that he could demonstrate. All righty. Uh, I hope we covered a lot of stuff tonight. I know I did. And I hope I did the demonstration for you that it made clear. I was jumping through an awful lot of websites, and I apologize. But what I want you to realize is part of what you're doing in this class is you're becoming very proficient at using all these different tools that we throw around at you. Uh, all the time. And that way, your toolkit that TPAC talks about, you become as good as anybody when it comes to using technology because you understand. Uh, oh, I didn't see this about the live text. Yes, you do. Unless this is the only class you're going to take. We can have a, uh, yeah, I think it is in the syllabus. It has to be because we all have to put it in there. We'll have a conversation. We can have a conversation. Okay. Uh, the other piece of information I need to give everybody in the 585 class is what I gave everybody in the 587 class, which is next Monday is Memorial Day. Uh, you do not need to be here in uh, synchronous time. I will go ahead and make a, a short presentation. Uh, I will be honest with you. I'll be sitting at a beach. I have a condo in Fort Morgan, Alabama that sits right on the ocean. And uh, I'm going to go kick back and spend some quality time with my wife and our two dogs and uh, just enjoy, enjoy, enjoy a place that I hope eventually that I will move to. It's a beautiful condominium, uh, lots of room, beautiful balcony that looks over the ocean. Um, it's very, very isolated, uh, but very new, and it has all the amenities that you could want from pools to fitness rooms to um, uh, hot tubs. So it's a great place. The only bad thing about it is, like I said, it's rather a isolated, so it's about a 20-minute, 20 25-minute drive to get into um, town <laughs> uh, to go to any restaurants or to get to the grocery store, etc. Although right up the road from us is a place where I can go buy all the fresh shrimp or fresh fish that I want that came in on the boats that day. So I will not physically be here next Monday, so don't pop in here looking for me thinking we can sit here and chat. I'll just have a collaborate movie that will be done that you can watch. If there isn't any other questions, of course, all the questions I can get right now are from Jim. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question real fast, Jim. Uh, are you going to take uh, any participation this summer in this thing uh, that Brian Deal is putting together called NICREC, where they're talking about uh, homeland security and uh, kids uh, learning code? Yeah. And using, uh, yeah. you are going to do that? Yes, I'm signed up for all four sessions. Good. You're going to be here at U of L. All right, good, because we were going to possibly have it at Central if you guys couldn't do it, but we'll be happy to go to U of L. Yeah, I, I'm real. I am just pumped. <laughs> I'm really excited for you guys to be here, and I've, I've kind of talked to Ryan a little bit about the. Those of you who are watching this uh, video can now turn it off. <laughs> I've been talking to Ryan about this Let's Start Coding. Have you seen that? It's a kit. Yeah, I saw it in your office. I've uh, picked it up uh, yeah. in some of the maker fairs. I've seen them there. I'm going to talk to Ryan and see if he wants to try to bring this guy in on it too. But I, I, I understand what Ryan's got. He's got that whole new correct curriculum, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just, I'm just very excited about doing it. So I'll see you again toward the end of the summer. That's great. All right. All right, my friend. Any, any last thoughts about this? Boy, I blew through it almost too fast. But I think we got it, don't you? And it certainly is a lot easier than the test was. 
is the other class. So enjoy building your blend space. Enjoy uh, finding those, some great videos in that online. And I will talk at you again, okay? Closing it down.